Thank you so much, my sister. Our speaker this morning is Shepherdess Nokanyo Mglovu, who is running an abuse and violence awareness series from last week. She spoke to us uh, from 2 Samuel 11, verse 27, with the topic, You are the men. Speak to us, my queen. It's your time now. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Shelley. Good morning, beloved of the Almighty King. I greet you this morning. In the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today, uh, the title of our short message is, He Came from the Philistines. He Came from the Philistines. And I read from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of God, whose height was six cubits and a span. Let us pray. Oh, dear Jesus, what a beautiful day it is because you are in it. What a privilege to wake up and fall into your everlasting arms. And what a privilege to start the day at your feet, oh dear Jesus. And now as you are going to speak your word, as we are listening as your children, we thank you that your word heals, your word restores, your word revives, your word corrects, your word rebukes, and your word repairs. And you have said, your word, oh God, is sharper than any double-edged sword, and that it will not go back not having accomplished its task. Now, dear God, I pray that you may create in me a clean heart so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my soul can be acceptable unto you. We welcome you, oh Holy Spirit. We welcome you to speak life into us. This is my humble prayer in your mighty name, oh Jesus, amen. So if you read the book of First Samuel chapter 17, Okay, just one moment. I hope that is uh, okay now, brother. Sorry. Okay. If you read from the book of First Samuel chapter 17, uh, you are going to discover that uh, the author of the story actually goes at length to describe not just the, the champion or the hero or the giant Goliath. He actually describes the armory also, as if he truly wants us to have an explicit picture of this giant. Now this giant is terrorizing the Israelites. He's defying the armies of the living God. He's mocking God in the process. And notice though, that though Goliath is the protagonist in this event, he is not alone. He has the backing of other soldiers. He's being cheered on. He's being applauded and celebrated. He represents a system. He comes out of and is a product of something. He comes from the Philistines, so says the writer. If we had time, we would also look at the young boy, David, for he's also a product of a system. He's a product of a structure, a structure that upholds certain values and principles. You know, last year I started a new job. And on my first day, I had a conversation with the area commissioner. Our conversation took us to my previous job, uh, uh, which had been at a tertiary institution. As soon as he heard that I had worked with university students, he began to just uh, unleash this pain onto me. He spoke bitterly about the recklessness of the university students. He spoke about the immorality. He spoke about the substance abuse. He spoke about the debauchery. He spoke even about uh, blaming NSFAS, the bursary that usually gives, a, that is given to those students who cannot afford. And he went on and on and on. And finally, he exclaimed in exasperation, what is wrong with these children? What is wrong with these children? And he looked at me as if he expected me to have a perfect answer. I gently said to him, maybe the question should be, what is wrong with us? Now he looked at me in confusion. And to clarify, I said to him, 
You see, my boss, we are the factory that is producing them. They are our children. So as we speak about abuse and violence, not just for the sake of really speaking about it so that you can just tick it off our list, but so that you can be empowered, so that you can be challenged, so that you can know where and how we as individuals and families and churches can intervene. I want us to remember that the very first recorded, recorded act of violence occurred within a family setting, the very first family on this planet Earth, brother against brother. But even before this violent act, a lot of abuse occurred in this very first family between Adam and Eve. And it all started with them both abusing their freedom of choice and failing to take responsibility for their actions. Now, if we can take a brief look at this family, these two containers, and I want you to have at the back of your mind, the title, he came from the Philistines. So we're looking at these two containers and the relationship, what we call in psychology, the space between the environment. We will recall that when Eve conceived Cain, she was carrying a guilt and shame over her sin, grief over uh, losses in Cain, and these were major losses too. She was carrying fear and anxiety about what the future held. I mean, she had the words from God, woman, what is this that you have done? And she had heard the declaration, I will now put enmity between you and the snake, between your seed and the seed of the snake. And she must have been wondering, what did that even mean? And of course, there were the words of resentment from her husband, who had just thrown her under the bus. This woman you gave me. So the container, the incubator is contaminated as she, as she bears for nine months carries this product, which was Cain. But what about Adam, who was the sperm donor? He is guilty after betraying God's trust and failing to protect what had been entrusted to him. He's bitter and resentful. He harbors both repressed and suppressed anger towards Eve. He is filled with shame over being weak-willed and failing to say no to Eve, failing to trust God to handle the situation and failing also to take responsibility for his part in this sin. He is hurting and grieving. He has anxiety over what the future holds. I mean, he can't even begin to, to imagine what does toiling and sweating mean? What, what, what does God mean when he talks about thorns and thistles? And of course, both their DNA now bore the imprint of sin. And because we produce what we carry, it's no wonder that they gave birth to Cain, rebellious, reckless, defiant, audacious Cain, who without guilt or, or shame, brazenly looks at God and responds, am I my brother's keeper? To the question, where is your brother? You know, the two things that God blessed during creation, the family and the Sabbath. The devil has tried his utmost to destroy. The family structure has become so eroded that you are producing monsters. I mean, imagine a 17 year old who rapes and murders an 11 year old neighbor. And you only discover that he has two pending rape offenses. The question is, what happened to this child? Can you imagine three medical students who rape a fellow student just to confirm that indeed she is the virgin that she claims she is. And just so that they can give her a taste of what they think she is missing. And imagine if these three medical students who are going to be our future doctors even sent her video clips and images three weeks later, no guilt, no sense of remorse. Where do they come from? How did they get to be where they are at? And imagine during the trial of these three young boys, one of their fathers is caught on audio 
as they are looking at the video, you know, they are looking at the atrocity of what the sons have done. The comment from the father is, mm, she has such a beautiful body. You know, one person has said, yes, it is nature. It is genes or genetics that load the gun, but it is nature or the environment that pulls the trigger. You know, sometimes we speak about generational curses so lightly and so casually. Sometimes you have no idea, none at all, how far the devil unrebuked or how much damage or how far the devil unrebuked can go. We need to watch and pray always, not just for things or jobs, not just for, 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 for promotions, not just for houses, not just for land, but you need to pray against spiritual forces of evil that lie ever so near. The lion that roars around, the, the, the devil that roars around like a, a lion seeking for whom he may devour. We need to pray for the cleansing of our bloodline from our past wickedness, our poor choices, our acts of rebellion against God. But you also need to pray for the wickedness of our forefathers. I mean, think about the legacy we have inherited from our parents. Think about cancer and diabetes. Think about hypertension. Think about rebelliousness. Think about sexual immorality. Think about promiscuity. Some of us are fathers, we don't know what it is to have self-control. Some of us are mothers, when we got married, we are not pure. Some of us have never said no to immorality. So these monsters, they come from us. Think about the legacy, the entitlement, the aggression, the violence. You know, Jeremiah says, the fathers and mothers eat the sour grapes, but it is children's teeth that are set on edge. So I want to say to you, we are born in relationships, are wounded in relationships, but also get healed in a relationship with the one who says, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. And he heals us to create relationships that are going to be vehicles of healing and restoration. You and I are a product of something. And until we acknowledge our woundedness and ask God for healing, we may sit for 38 years by the pool without benefiting from its stirring. We may literally die from thirst whilst we are packed next to a fountain that flows with the sweetest of healing waters. And we will unfortunately pass the baton to our offspring. You know, I have been sitting in therapy with a young man who is seeing me for many issues, including addictions. And for one reason or another, despite his father being physically present, he told me with a lot of anger and resentment that he was fathered in the streets. I mean, the boy had a home, but he says to me, Ma, I was fathered in the streets. And ironically, this boy now has a six year old son and he's wounding him exactly the way he was also wounded and he's not even aware of it. What an unending cycle. You know, I want to say to you, God can no more heal what we do not acknowledge than he can forgive the sins that we do not confess. And today, as you ponder over these words, as I ponder over these words, we need to think about, we need to think about our own relationships. We need to think about our own relationships when you talk about this abuse and violence. How are things in your boat? Does love live there? Does joy live there? Does kindness and gentleness live there? Is there selflessness and sacrificing of self on behalf of your family? You know, we know that God hates divorce, but you also need to know that he also hates the homes we build that are devoid of love and gentleness and mercy. They are not pleasing to him either. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. When the children of Israel sat down to eat and they rose up to play. Goliath 
who the giant who terrorized the armies of the living God, he came from the Philistines. But I want us to be encouraged. God still heals the broken hearted, provided those who are broken acknowledge their brokenness and confess their brokenness and come to the, live, to, to the, to the river of living waters, not just to park next to it, not just to watch others, not just to tell others to drink, not just to watch others as they drink, but to drink from the fountain of the living waters so that this God, he creates in us, not, he, he does not just quench our own thirst, he does not just heal our brokenness, but in us, he creates this fountain that is gonna overflow and it's gonna be a source of healing for other people. And then we can go back into the village that is so filled with this abuse and violence. And we can say, come see a man. There is a fountain, brothers and sisters, filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's wounds and sinners dipped or plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilt stay. In Ezekiel 37, we are told that bones, yes, even dry, dry bones can and do live again. When God breathes on them, the breath of life. He came from the Philistines. He was a product of a container. And I challenge you today, as we look at abuse and violence, and we point it out there, how are things in your boat? What kind of a product are you unleashing into the world? What's your factory there? What are you doing in that factory? May God bless the reading of his word. May he bless our containers. May he bless our boats so that they can be sources, they can be fountains of healing. And so, dear God, we want to say thank you. Your word is living and powerful. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. And you use it for healing of our brokenness. And here we are, having drunk. We know that you have just yet begun the good work in us. And you are so faithful. You say in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the one who has begun the good work in us, not around us, not about us, in us is faithful enough to see it to completion. Dalang apaga to go to go see him. It is your essence. Heal this brokenness in us. Heal these wounds, these tendencies, these patterns, these stereotypes, these attitudes that we have inherited from our fathers and forefathers and the society. And we thank you for the healing that comes from you. Thank you, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. In your mighty name, O Jesus, we have prayed. Amen.